Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We're hitting you up with the biggest Supreme Court of them all, and that's Marbury versus Madison. There's three reasons you need to know it. Number one, it's gonna be on the test, I promise you. Number two, you're not allowed to talk about judicial power if you don't know Marbury versus Madison. And number three, what an awesome story. It's a pretty cool story. Here we go, Gideon. Marbury versus Madison established judicial review. Marbury versus Madison established judicial review. So here's the story. It's a pretty cool story. We have the election of 1800, also called the Revolution of 1800, because in a sense we have really um, a transfer of political power going from the Federalists to the Democratic Republicans. And of course in 1800 we have Thomas Jefferson who's elected. But the story gets interesting, not with the election of Jefferson, but with the period between the election and the actual taking of oath of office, which is on March 4th of 1801. So we have kind of this, what's called a lame duck session, really in the beginning of 1801, where you have John Adams and a Federalist Congress. Remember, Adams is a Federalist, and you have a Federalist Congress, and they're still in charge of making and signing laws. We haven't switched the dates yet to January 20th. So during this lame duck session, they go a little bit cray cray. They're going to pass a law which is called the Judiciary Act of 1801, an extension of the Judiciary Act of 1789, which really is going to create new district courts and new circuit courts and new justices of the peace. This is a position that wasn't even in the original Constitution. Um, and they're going to do that in order for John Adams on March 3rd, the day before Jefferson comes to town. Jefferson's all like, yo, go to the White House. And in the office the night before, Adams is like on the phone, like, yo, you want to be a judge? These are called the Midnight Judges. And he ends up uh, appointing 16 circuit judges and 42 justices of the peace. One of them is, you're getting ready, you've been waiting for it, William Marbury, right? We've got half the story, Marbury versus Madison. So this judge, Marbury, is all excited. The next day he's like, I'm going to be a judge. I'm going to know you're not. So this is where the story gets interesting. So on March 4th, the day that Thomas Jefferson's going to take his oath of office, right? He's getting ready. He's like, getting ready. Here we go. You actually have John Marshall. Remember that name because he's been appointed to be the chief justice of the Supreme Court, but he hasn't taken that job yet. You know what job he has? He's still the acting secretary of state for John Adams. You want to know what his job is? His job is to give these appointments out to get these judges confirmed. It goes to the Senate, it comes right back to John Marshall, and he's running around like a madman, like handing out judgeships. And then, alas, the clocks strike Jefferson. And Jefferson takes over without all of the judgeships, I don't know if that's a word, without all of the judgeships, I'm going to say it again, being given out. And guess who didn't get their judgeship? Just guess. I guess you have a billion choices. No, you know it. It's William Marbury. And now we have a new man in town. Yo, TJ's in town. So Jefferson wakes up the next day and he's like, what the heck has happened, Adams? What are you doing? This is crazy. And Adams is like, yo, dig it. You got to give these judgeships out. And Jefferson is like, dig it? No. And he orders his uh, acting secretary of state, who's a guy by the name of Levi Lincoln, which is a really cool name for being at 1801, by the way. Um, and later, his secretary of state, get ready, you're going to be excited about this one, it's going to be James Madison. <gasps> Marbury versus Madison. And they're basically going to refuse to give these commissions out. They're going to say, we're not going to do it. We think that the 1801 Judiciary Act is complete poop poop. I said poop poop. And they're actually going to get the new Democratic Republican Congress to pass the Judiciary Act of 1802, which got rid of the Judiciary Act of 1801, and also canceled the Supreme Court for a whole year. What are you doing? But nevertheless, we have our situation now where um, you're going to have William Marbury going to the high court, who's run now by John Marshall, who was the guy who didn't get to give him his job because the time ran out. It's a pretty cool story. <laughs> So the decision comes down in 1803. It's actually a 4 nothing decision. 1803 because they canceled 1802. And John Marshall, again, he's the guy who didn't get to give William Marbury his commission. Time ran out. 
is now ruling on the matter. And here's what he comes up with. He says, you got to know two things first. You got to know Constitution, Article 3, Section 2, Clause 2, which is really the judicial power that the Constitution gives to the court. It gives them something called original jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction just means that this would be where you would go directly to the Supreme Court, ambassadors and cases that involve states, and really there's very few instances of original jurisdiction. And then it talks really about appellate jurisdiction, that they're going to hear court cases that arise from the lower courts where there's some sort of dispute. And that really is the extent of judicial power. Nowhere in there does it give the court exclusive right to declare laws passed by Congress to be unconstitutional. But then he goes goes on to say, you got to know something else. you got to know about the Judiciary Act of 1789, which these guys were amending the Judiciary Act of 1801, the Judiciary Act of 1802. And in the Judiciary Act of 1789, you find the language where basically Congress has created a new piece of original jurisdiction. Basically what this clause says in the Judiciary Act of 1789 is that the Supreme Court will now have the power to order what's called writs of mandamus. And I could be butchering that. But in this writ of mandamus, it's like a mandate from the court. They're now given permission to tell basically an executive department like Jefferson, you've got to give this guy his job. And basically what Marshall comes up with is three questions. He says, look, should William Marbury have gotten his job? Was that done legally? He goes, yeah, he should have his job. He definitely should have his job. And did he do the right thing by coming to us? He said, yeah. So it's right there, Judiciary Act 1789, go to Supreme Court, issue every mandate, is going to the right place. Yet. But number three, can the Supreme Court enforce it? Can they tell the executive department through a writ of man, Damis, that they have to hire this guy, William Marbury? And what John Marshall says, and this is where he's going to make an enemy in William Marbury, is I can't give you your job because that's not in the original Constitution. The original Constitution is nothing about these writs of mandamus. This comes from expanding original jurisdiction that was done in the Judiciary Act of 1789. You can't do that! You can't do that! Basically, we have a problem. We have a problem where you have a law passed by Congress and you have the words of the Constitution. And even though it's not in the Constitution, and this is where it gets really weird, basically, even though I really shouldn't have taken the case in the first place because I don't have original jurisdiction, I did anyway, and now I'm going to decide that original jurisdiction really shouldn't ever be expanded and that it violates the Constitution. So I'm going to give myself a new power, which is not in the Constitution, to declare laws unconstitutional. Marbury vs. Madison established judicial review. He says, he says, look it, I took an oath to the Constitution, not to the laws passed by Congress. So if there is a distinction between a law passed by Congress and my beloved Constitution, not only did I take an oath to it, but there's a supremacy clause. I'm going to side with the Constitution. I'm not going to enforce the law which I believe is unconstitutional. Because in a sense, why do we have a Constitution if we don't have a court which is going to be the judge in a sense? But at the end of the day, what they have done is that they've given themselves almost law-making powers. We can see Judicial Review taking action in something like Miranda versus Arizona, where the court creates a rule for policemen to read suspects their rights. Or expanding upon the right to an attorney, where now the state has to pay for an attorney for indigent peoples. These are all not in the Constitution. The right to an abortion, the right to privacy. There's a tons of rights that come from judicial interpretation. And you can take it or leave it. I don't really care. You doesn't care. But now you know it because you're smarter for it. All right, guys. If you haven't checked out Hip Use History, we have a whole bunch of lectures. You should check it out right now and you should subscribe because it's so wrong not to at least subscribe, isn't it? Where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you next time when you press my buttons.